Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who gather from different parts of the world. Uh, this is another Sunday cultural storytelling event where we share stories about food, history, travel, nature, and inspiring people stories, famous or infamous. Today, we have Mark, a very familiar face who joined us. Uh, he has many, many roles. He's the president of Robert Burns World Federation Society, the vice president of UK's Workers Educational Association. He's a humanist, performance point, writer, and folklorist. Today, he's going to talk about two birds we will commonly find in UK. Uh, UK has an outdoor culture. Most people like to do outdoor activities, one of them being bird watching. Um, if you come here, you see a group of people gather together. They're probably not doing people watching, but bird watching. <laughs> so <laughs> here we go. Uh, Mark, I'm going to spotlight you and put you on the stage. OK, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try and share almost from the, the start the um, presentation. So I'm just hoping that it will do what it's supposed to do. So hopefully you're seeing a screen now with uh, a bird at the top. That, yeah, that's right. Excellent. OK, that's good. Uh, well, I'm a, uh, in addition to everything else that I do, I'm a folklorist. And that means that I'm interested in the stories that are told about different creatures and, uh, and ideas that underpin uh, what you, uh, how you do things. Um, so uh, for example, in this country, if you are afraid of something happening, you say, uh, or oh, hope that doesn't ha happen, touch wood. And to touch wood, you have to touch a piece of wood and that gives you the luck to be certain that it's not going to happen. Uh, obviously, it's all nonsense, but at the same time, uh, I, I can guarantee that if, if I say touch wood, anybody nearby me will touch the closest to the wood that they possibly can, because it's, it's a superstition that we have all taken on board. So that's what I'm going to be talking about, is the folklore of uh, the robin and the wren. And uh, I'm going to ask a, a, a couple of questions, first of all. So the first question I want to know is, what do you think uh, was the Celtic bird of power? And I, I've got some choices for you. An eagle, a robin, a wren, or it didn't have one. So if you can put this in the chat. Now, I can't see the chat, unfortunately, so um, yeah. Minji's going to have to tell Yeah, me I'll read what. out for you. Yeah. So is it, okay. is it A, B, C, or D? People are debating D as dog. And B, boy, we got several answers. B, boy, or D, dog. It, it's a difficult one. Oh, yes, yes. Oh. Uh, I'm not asking easy questions. You know. Oh, actually, Mark, you've got A, B, C, D. Oh. Okay. So we're, we're going right across it. But it looks to me like most people are going for D in the ones that I can see. I've, I've now managed to get chat up, so I'm, I'm looking at them. Most of them are D. Well, the, the Celts did have a bird of power, and their bird of power was the wren, okay? Now, very soon I'll show you a wee picture of the wren because it's very interesting when you see it. But I'm, I'm now going to ask you another question, very similar to the first question. So let's just see if I can do that now. Okay, so this is your, this is your next question. What was the imperial bird of Rome? What bird was the Roman imperial bird? And again, the choices are exactly the same. <laughs> A, eagle, B, robin, C, wren, or D, it didn't have one. Uh, we oh, got sorry. eagle A, and yep. E for boy, robin, and D for, it didn't have one, A, yep. eagle. Okay. So again, yeah, we're getting, it looks like most people are putting down A for eagle. Uh, with oh, one or two with these, and that would be right. The imperial bird of Rome was the eagle, and that's why you see it on all of the, um, the their army um, standards. It had the eagle at the top of the standard, um, and that's uh, because it was their imperial bird. So remember that the Celts were always the enemies of the Romans. 
okay, the Celtic people. And the Celt when I say the Celtic people, it's a difficult concept because uh, it's not one particular tribe, but lots and lots of tribes who, who had a kind of common view of the world. They weren't a people as such, but they had a kind of common view of the world and uh, they were usually against the Romans. Okay, so eagle is right. Uh, that was the, the Roman bird of um, in, uh, imperial bird. Now I'm gonna ask you one last question. The, uh, again, the answers are all exactly the same. So it could be your choices are A, eagle, B, robin, wren, or it doesn't have one. Which bird is the British national bird? Okay. Somebody said it has to be B. Has it to has be, to be B. Is, that, is that right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> you have uh, A and B. A lot of bees. A lot of a bees. Lot of bees. Yeah, I see that. Uh, well, I, I hate to tell you, but you're all being silly bees, um, <laughs> because because it, in reality, in truth, we don't have a national bird in <laughs> in, in the UK. But and this is where it gets nicely complicated. If we did have one, and there was a, a, a poll recently introduced by a guy, uh, by an ornithologist called David Lindo, uh, and he put it out uh, to ask people what they thought should be the British bird. And those who put down B are almost right, because he got 224,000 people responding. And of them, uh, the robin came top with 34% of the vote, followed by the barn owl, with 12% uh, and the blackbird with 11%. But we really don't, we don't have an official bird. Unlike the uh, New Zealanders who have the Kiwi, we do not have an official um, bird um, in Britain, but the robin comes the closest. So you can see already the robin and the wren are quite important to us. And that's very strange because uh, this is a wee picture after this <coughs> of the robin and the wren. And they're actually really very small birds. So that was a bit faster than it should have been. Unfortunately, I've gone past that slide now. But anyway, it's they're they're very small birds. Um, incredibly small birds. And you kind of think to yourself, well, how is that possible? Why are they so important to the, the British folklore? And it goes something like this. There's a saying in, in the British folklore which goes, the robin redbreast and the wren are God Almighty's cock and hen. Okay, so the idea is that uh, they're so important that God has actually made them husband and wife. That's what cock and hen means. So he's made them husband and wife. That's a really crazy idea. Two very small birds and very different birds are actually supposed to be in folklore, husband and wife. And that proverb still exists in, uh, in our thinking. Uh, so that's really curious. Now, the reason for this is that the, Robin, the wren was associated with the Celts, as I said, and in particular, their, their um, holy men were called Druids. And if you look back far enough, you can find that the word Druid signifies both a Druid, that's their, their shaman or their holy man, and the wren. It was the same word that they used for the Druid and the wren. So in other words, there was this kind of idea within Celtic mythology that a druid, a shaman, uh, a druid shaman could convert himself into being a wren. So if he was if he was threatened, he would turn himself into a wren and he'd fly away. That was that was part of the the idea behind it. So that's really interesting, isn't it? And, and very odd. The only the, the other bird that's smaller than a wren in Britain, because the, the wren is almost our smallest bird. It's really only about, you can see my fingers on the screen at all. It's really only about that size. I mean, it's an incredibly small bird for, uh, for being as important as it is. And the robin is, is just a bit bigger. Uh, it's, it's not that much bigger. It's not like the American or the Canadian robins, which are really from the magpie family, from our side of the world. Their robins are much bigger. They're about that uh, kind of size uh, and aren't even of the same species as the robins that we get here in this country. So the husband and wife in mythology. And that seems crazy. But not only that, the other thing about the wren is not only is he compared with the name of the druids, uh, his name is exactly the same, but his common name in the folklore is king of birds king of birds okay 
So I'm going to give you some of the, the names that, he, that he's actually called in different parts of Europe to this day. If you go to, uh, if you look at the Latin, for example, uh, the word regulus, meaning king, was used to refer to both the gold crest and the wren. And the gold crest is the other bird that's smaller than the wren, and they get confused in folklore all the time. So when I say gold crest, I mean wren, and when I say wren, I mean gold crest. It's just the way it is with folklore here. So regulus, uh, in Latin, referred to both gold crest and the wren and meant king. In Greek, the wren is basiculus, the little king. In modern France, a variety of words are used called roilet, little king, roi de roiseau, the king of all birds, roi de freude, cold weather king, and roi de guille, or lively or crafty king. In Italian, the wren is riatino, little king, and ri de sip, king of the hedgerow. In Swedish, it is kungsvogel, king's fowl, whilst in Danish, it is elekonik, hedge king. In German, it is Donnerkonig, Thorn King, or Schielekonig, the Snow King, or the Mouseikonig, the Mouse King. Thus, it becomes clear throughout Europe, even to the modern period, the wren is considered to be the king of birds. Now, that's pretty crazy, isn't it? Now, one explanation of this is that you've all heard of King Arthur, I'm guessing, uh, and his Knights of the Round Table. Well, in his last battle, it said that uh, when uh, he lost that battle and all of his knights were being killed, their souls flew into the, a, herd, a, a flock of, uh, of wrens and flew off uh, because uh, that's, that meant, meant, meant they could be reborn in the future. So that's one of the reasons. So it was a king's bird. But beyond that, the reason why a wren became the king of all birds is really very interesting. Now, some of you have already said about the, the eagle, and a lot of people assume that the eagle is king of birds. But if you look at folklore, this is the story. Many, many years ago, there was a great assembly of all the birds of the world. The penguins and the seagulls and the eagles and the geese and the... Um, Oh, every bird of the, of the world all came together in one place and they were arguing amongst themselves. They looked at the world of man and they said, well, the world of man has kings. Why can't we have a king? So they thought, well, how can we decide who is going to be our king? And they decided that whichever bird could fly the highest was going to be the king. Well, of course, the eagle thought everybody else stands no chance. I'm going to be king because I can fly the highest. So up he flew along with the geese and along with the hens tried flying, but they didn't get very far. The penguins, they just flapped their, their wings and nothing happened at all. Uh, oh. Hello, I, I, I seem to have got lost here. Did you, did something stop sharing there? Um, I was, can you, Try again, Mark, sorry. Okay, no problem. Uh, right, I'll just need to. Okay, are we back to, back to where we should be? Right, so as I was saying, all the birds flew up, except for the, uh, the birds that couldn't fly, like penguins. This, the eagle was flying higher and higher and higher until he was higher than any other bird. And he was just about to declare himself the king when guess what? The little wren had been sitting on the rough of the back of his neck. And as the eagle got as high as he could and was getting pretty tired, so the wee wren, who hadn't done anything at all, flew up just a wee bit above the king, uh, above the eagle, and said, I'm your king, I'm your king, I've flown highest. Well, you can imagine, you can imagine the birds thought, this is a bit cheeky. This is a bit of, of, of cheating, to say the least. So they decided that... Uh, they, they couldn't argue with the fact that he had actually beaten the eagle. He got higher than, than the, the eagle had, but they thought it was cheating. So being, being kind of angry about, about this, they decided that what they would do is they would drown the wren when he got back to earth. So they gave the job to the owl and they said to the owl, what we want you to do is gather some moon tears, bring them in a bowl, and then when the wren lands, drown the wren in the uh, bowl. 
So they, the owl went away, went to the moon, got some moon tears, brought the bowl back and tripped. And the water from the moon splashed all over the place and there was no water left to drown the wren. So when the wren landed, they had to acknowledge that the wren was king. So can you imagine? They weren't very pleased about it. They had a king, but such a tiny little bird wasn't really worth being king, was it? The eagle, pff, he was very cross. And he said to the other birds, if that's going to be your king, I'm flying off to the mountains and I'm never coming back. So he flew off to the mountains, leaving the little wren as their king. But they were so annoyed with the wren that they said to the wren, right, you can be king, but you'll have to live in the hedgerow from now on. So to this day, if you're ever looking for a, a wren, you'll find the wren in the hedgerow because that's where it lives. What they did to the owl was they said to the owl, well, you've spilt the moon's tears. So from this time on, we don't want to see you. You have to fly by nighttime. You can't fly during the day. So we have explanations there for why the owl flies by night, why the eagle doesn't associate with other birds, and why the wren lives in the hedgerow. Brilliant little stories, and that's all part of the folklore. So the other thing to note is that the wren beats the eagle. Which, uh, organ which uh, country was it that, or which imperial country was it that had the eagle as its chief? The Romans. So it actually beats the Romans. And this was a kind of joke that was part of the, uh, the storyline. So they could say to the Romans, well, you may have your imperial eagle, but in actual fact, our wren is cleverer than yours. And to this day in this country, we have a little saying which says, uh, a little bird told me. And the idea is that the little wren is flying up beside your ear and whispering in your ear truths that you wouldn't otherwise know. And that, again, is part of the, the story of the robin and the wren. So I'm now going to show you what the wren is actually so important that there are several um, sayings that are still there. And this is one, ever trouble a robin or ran, never prosper boy or man. Uh, in English, very often the word wren gets uh, the, the letter E becomes A um, for no good reason at all. So ran and man rhyme properly in this. So ever trouble a robin or ran, never prosper boy or man. And the idea of this was that you never troubled the nest of a robin or a wren, because if you did, you would uh, end up with some bad luck. Now, one of the things that some of you know, if you're a coin collector, is that the farthing, which was our smallest coin in the uh, 1930s and the 1950s, actually had the symbol of a wren on it. And this is a, a wee symbol of the, of the wren on the, on the farthing. Um, and that lasted from 1936 to 1952. Uh, so all farthings in that period of time uh, were, the, were the wren. So it's clear it was a quite important, wasn't it? A quite important bird. Now also, uh, one of the things that was found fairly recently was a uh, in 2011 was a ring uh, called the Saffron Waldron Gold Ring. And this ring, if you look at it, uh, it's gold. But if you look at the, um, the the face of the ring, you'll see that it has a picture of a man with a bird's head. So if you remember what I was saying about their shaman, the idea that, that the druids could convert to being bird or human, depending on what they wanted to be. And you'll also see that above the, uh, the shaman, who's also holding a Christian cross. So this is obviously uh, the transition when uh, this country was beginning to become Christianized. Uh, you see he's holding a, a staff with a cross on it. And there behind him, he's also got a bird uh, or a bird-like figure that seems to be whispering or, or chatting in his ear. Uh, so that's how important birds are in, in the Celtic mythology. Um, as, the, as the Druid bird, the wren became uh, associated with the most important tree to the druids or the shaman and that was in this country the oak tree is the most important tree um, and especially in summertime when the oak is in full bloom and that's when the wren becomes king in the summertime literally at the the, the middle of the year uh, round about the the 21st of of june that's when the wren becomes king um, but he doesn't have it easy. Uh, as he goes through the year, when it gets close to Christmas time, 
if you live in this country, you'll know that you get a lot of Christmas cards with robins on them. Uh, robins, along with their tree, the holly tree. And in addition to the holly tree, you've also very often get some ivy in the in the Christmas card images as well, because robins, holly, and ivy are linked together. In wrens, oak, and mistletoe are linked together. The mistletoe was very very important to the druids uh, as well. So when you when you're talking about druid mythology, you've always got similarities, but they're never exact similarities. So if you think about the leaf of a holly tree and the leaf of an oak tree, there's something that's quite similar in the look of them, even though the holly tree is a jaggy leaf and the holly the oak tree is a is a soft leaf. The shape of them is still very similar, and that's typical of uh, Celtic mythology, where you have something that's similar but different. Uh, the same with the uh, with the ivy. The ivy is is in full bloom during the winter. Uh, the mistletoe is in, is in bloom during the the summer, and that's important as well. So it's my thinking, uh, and I'm I'm I've worked on this for a long, long time, that. The, that the birds were really important in terms of the calendar to the old people uh, in this country and in Europe. And I think that Christmas time marked the time when the, the uh, robin became the king and the summer marked the time when the wren became the king. But how did, the, how did it happen that the kings were changed over? Well, this again is another very interesting story and I'm going to show you a picture of what's known as the hunt of the wren and on, on, and on the 26th of december every year the wren is hunted in some parts of uh, the uk ireland the isle of man and in some places in europe and this picture shows you a group of boys going out and they're called the ran boys or the wren boys and they're going out uh, in dingle county Derry here um, on st stephen's day the 26th of december and they're out to try and catch a wren OK, uh, and when, when they catch the wren, they treat it as if it's a very uh, heavy bird, a really important bird. Now, remember that the wren is only that size, but they actually treat it as though it, it's something incredibly important and, and incredibly big. And there's a little saying that they, they use when they've caught a wren. They go around from door to door and they use this particular phrase. The wren, the wren is king of the birds, and Stephen Days was caught in the furs. Although he is little, his honour is great, and so good people play, give us a treat. And the idea is that it's a bit like trick and treat that you do that, that happens in, in, in America and Canada. The idea was you went door to door and you, you asked for money, uh, or you asked for something to be given to you uh, because you had captured the wren. And when you captured the wren, this is what you did you put him in a box like this. And this is a, a, a box from Wales. So there we have Ireland and Wales. And I can tell you that this still occurs in the Isle of Man, some places in the north of Europe, in Brittany. Um, so it's still going on. This is another, phrase, another um, poem that's very, very old. That's to do with the same uh, hunting. We hunted the wren for Robin the Bobbin. We hunted the wren, says Jack in the land. We hunted the wren, says Richard the Robin. We hunted the wren for every one. So that, again, is just telling you that there's something really interesting going on. You're switching between the robin and the wren at Christmas, uh, just after Christmas, on the, 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 literally the day after Christmas, on the 26th of December. Now, why was the wren, who was king for a period of time, knocked off his perch and replaced by the robin? It's because you needed to signify to a people who needed ceremonies uh, at the turns of the year when those turns of the year were happening. Now, I'm, what I'm not saying is we're not talking about a new year term uh, change of, of, of term because the new year for the Celts was actually in October, November. It, it was literally at the turnover between uh, October and November. What this is, is a ceremonial turn of the year. So this is between what's known as the dark year and the light year. So the light year is um, really is from December to June when the light in the sky gets, you know, the days get longer and longer. That's when the robin is king. When the days get shorter and shorter, that's when the wren is the king. 
So you have the switchover of one thing and the other. So what about the uh, what about the robin then? Well, the robin occurs in all sorts of ways in our country. So this is this is one of the ways you can see the robin occurs has occurred more often than any other um, bird on our stamps. So here you have down here a uh, robin on the on the um, bottom right hand side with its wings sprayed. You can see it's a small toted little bird. Um, you've got the black bird, the blue tit, and the black headed gull. Then again, as I said, it's always associated with Christmas. So this is a, a second set of stamps, and these are a, a whole set of stamps dedicated to the robin. And you can see that in one of the images on the top right hand side, the robin is seen against the background of holly and holly berries, uh, and there's probably even some ivy in there as well. Now, we in this country don't talk about the fact that this is our folklore. We just kind of know it. So that if you, if you ask somebody, do you know uh, what is the folklore of a robin? Most people can't tell you. Uh, I've studied it, so I, I kind of have an idea of it. And again, more stamps were released. These are called the Christmas Smilers. And in every single one of these, there, again, there's a robin. So you've got a robin at the bird table. You've got a robin uh, pestering the cat. You've got a robin uh, pulling the scarf around the neck of a, of a snowman. Uh, and these were again released. Um, uh, I think they were released in, uh, uh, I think it was about 2010. Then again, you, the, the center one of this one is robin. And again, you see the holly, the holly berries and the star. So again, that association is being made between one thing and the other. And lastly, this was a, a stamp that was released in 2016 of the robin. So the robin has occurred on more stamps than any other uh, British bird. Now, another, another myth that links both the robin and the wren is that of the giving of fire to the earth. Now, there was a time in Celtic mythology when there was no such thing as fire on this planet. And what happened was that uh, they looked at the sun and the birds said, that would be really good. We could use that if we could bring that back down to, to earth. And they didn't know how to do it. So the little uh, wren said, well, I'm your king. So I'll fly up to the sun with a twig of oak and I'll stick this twig of oak into the, the, um, into the sun and I'll bring down the fire to earth. So he flew up along with lots of other birds who flew up to give him a bit of support. He got to the sun and he stuck the uh, bit of oak into the sun and the, uh, the sun caught it alight. So he thought, right, I, I'll bring it down to earth. And he brought it down and he brought it down and then he started to get really tired. And also the uh, twig was burning further and further along. And eventually he realized it was going to set him on fire. So he called out to the robin and he says to the robin, 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 please take this, this twig of fire before it catches fire to me. But too late, the, his tail caught fire. And to this day, that's why if you see a picture of a little wren, it looks like the, the end of its tail has been burnt off because it's such a short wee stubby tail. And that's the explanation for that. So the robin got hold of the, the twig. And unfortunately, when, he, when it was crossing over to him, the whole of the front of his breast caught fire. And that's why to this day, the robin has a red breast because his red breast were caught fire with the, the flames coming, um, bringing the, the fire to the earth. But the robin wasn't even able to bring the fire to the earth. Eventually, the lark had to come along and the lark took the twig of fire to the earth and the and fire was then brought to the earth for all for all peoples. So that, again, is another bit of the, the folklore that uh, exists between the, the robin and the wren. But, you know, it's, it's one of those interesting things. As I say, you're allowed to hunt the wren on one day of the year and you're allowed to hunt the robin on one day of the year. On the 26th of December, you can hunt the wren. You're not allowed to hunt it at any other time in folklore. You're not allowed to hunt the robin on any other day except the 24th of uh, June. That's the only day you're allowed to hunt the, the robin. And yet, that's really strange, isn't it? You've got, you've got this idea of the switching of the years. You've also got this idea that it's unlucky to actually hunt a wren on any other day. Remember that proverb that I had up before about... Uh, the idea of uh, it being unlucky for you for the rest of your life if you hunt a, a robin or a wren. But there was also this idea that the robin and the wren could indicate that death was going to happen. 
So if, for example, a robin flew into a house or a wren flew into a house, those two particular birds, then it was believed that somebody in that household would die. Okay, mm -hmm. if it flew into the house, and you, you know, uh, uh, then then it was certain that uh, you that, that somebody was going to die. And the other thing that it was believed was it was believed that um, the robin and the wren would cover the bodies of anybody who had died. If you if you you know if, if some creature had died in the forest, it was believed the robin and the wren would gather little leaves and cover the bodies of the. Uh, of the the dead creature, uh, and there's a um, a little verse in a play by John Webster, uh, who was writing in 1580 and 1625. He wrote a, a play called The White Devil, and in The White Devil, he's got this little phrase which tells you exactly what I'm saying: "Call for the robin redbreast and the wren, since over shady groves they hover, and with leaves and flower do cover the friendless bodies of unburied men." So this idea that if you fell in in a in a battle, the robin and the wren would uh, would cover you over with with leaves, isn't that a lovely idea? Isn't it rather beautiful. <laughs> so there are lots of other uh, legends to do with the the robin and the wren. One of them is that uh, you you know that I'm very keen on Robert Burns. Um, Robert Burns wrote a wee snippet uh, about the robin and the wren, and in front of you on the screen, you have that wee snippet. It isn't a full poem. Uh, he didn't get round to writing this whole poem, but uh, he wrote this bit. The robin to the wren's nest, come keeking in, come keeking in. Oh, wheels me on your old pal, would you be in, would you be in? Thou's near get leave to leave you out in the eye way in. And I way in, and I way in, so long as I hear an old clout to row you in, to row you in. Now that's in Scots, so um, I, I understand if you found it somewhat difficult to, to make head not tail of what I was saying, but basically what's happening is the robin is kicking in, is, is looking in to the house of the, the wren, the nest of the wren, and he's saying to you, uh, how are you doing? How's your old head? So he's saying to the, the, the wren, I, I know you're getting kind of old, uh, and he's saying, well, I could come in and you, and you could go out. You know, I could come in, you could go out. Uh, and I've got a, a cloth that I can wind you up in. Now, when he says the say uh, langs a hair no clute, that means to a cloth like a, a duster. A clute is a, is a duster or all clothes. It can be clothes as well. And what he's saying to the to the wren is he's saying, I can wrap you up. Now, in, in uh, UK, the idea was uh, a thing called the winding sheet. And a winding sheet was the, a, a piece of cloth that was kept for wrapping up a dead body. So he's saying to the wren, you're out, I'm in, I'm going to be king. So this is, this is really what Robin Burns, Robert Burns is saying this. And another interesting thing to know about Robert Burns is most people know him uh, by the shortened term Rabbi Burns. But in the only poem that we have written by Robert Burns himself about himself, he refers to himself as Robin not Rabbi and not Robbie. So I actually think he wanted to be called Robin, uh, not Rabbi or, or, or Robbie. And uh, I also think that he knew this folklore about Robins and Wrens very, very well. But going beyond that, this idea of the Robin and the Wren being married, that again is a, is a, a very old story. And this, this goes back to um, back to well before the 19th century. So here we have images from a book or a pamphlet that was um, released to people. Uh, and we have the wee wren and the wren and the robin uh, and the fox. Um, and the fox is, uh, you know, what's happened is that the, the wren has died. He's got married to the robin and the, the robin um, has given him something and the poor old wren has then died but he's not quite dead. So uh, along comes the fox and the fox is going to, uh, is going to take him off. And the Robin says, no, no, no that, that's not the way it's going to happen. Uh, you're not to take him off. And eventually they have this long discussion about how the, the wren is going to be treated in death. And the wren put, pokes up and says, I'm not dead. Because you know, he's got this kind of cheeky attitude to himself. But the, the Robin also has to die at the end of the year. And that we have a whole song called who killed cock robin and uh in this song uh it starts off who killed cock robin i said the sparrow with my bow and arrow i killed cock robin 
Who saw him die? I said the fly with my little eye. I saw him die. Who caught his blood? I said the fish with my empty dish. I caught his blood. So and so, and it goes on and, and it tells you all the different um, jobs that people had in terms of um, dealing with the poor old uh, Robin. Um, and it, and that's essential in folklore because if you've got somebody, if you've got a, to replace something, you need to give an explanation for how one creature dies and the other one replaces it. And this is a, um, a picture of what's called a chapbook. And these were ways of telling little stories that would be passed around a whole community. And they would be pretty cheap. They would be maybe a bit of a penny. Um, which uh, was, a, was just about our lowest uh, coin for, for a long time. Uh, and these would be sold for a penny um, and they would then be passed around the whole community. So it wasn't like it is now where if you've got a book, you put it in a, book a bookshelf. In these days, you would get a book and you would get this pamphlet and you would pass it around everybody you knew and they would all read the same story. And in the, in the life of Robert Burns, that's one of the ways in which he learns as much as he learns is because people kept giving him uh, books to read and pamphlets to read. And this one is called The Life and De Death of Jenny Wren. And uh, what I really like about it is the little verse that's there, which says, a very small book at a very small charge to learn them to read before they grow large. And I quite like that. So that's a nice kind of jokey wee uh, thing. But let's, let's just actually uh, take, this is another one which uh, uh, is said to have been related by Robert Burns to his sister Isabella. And again, it's the marriage of the Robin Redbreast and the Wren. And I've actually got a version of this being read. Um, and I'm going to play you a wee bit of it to see what you think of it. So this is it. And it's got a nice wee picture going on in it. So let's just see if I can get this to go. So was, uh, this is being related by a guy called uh, Tom Powell. Grey pussy bodrons, and she gaed a wa doon by a water side, and there she saw a wee robin redbreast happen on a briar. And pussy bodron says, Where's to gone, wee robin? And wee robin says, I'm going awa to the king to sing him a sang this good yule morning. And pussy bodron says, Come here, wee robin, and I'll let you see a bonny white ring. Run my neck. But wee Robin says, Na na, great pussy bodrons. Na na, he worried the wee moosey, but he'll no worry me. So wee Robin flew awa till he came to a fail fall dyke, and there he saw a grey greedy glad sitting. And grey greedy glad says, Where's two gone, wee Robin? And wee Robin says, I'm going to wa to the king to sing him a sang this good yule morning. And grey greedy glad says, Come here, wee Robin, and I'll let you see a bonny feather in my wing. But wee Robin says, No, nah, no, nah, grey greedy like glad, no, nah, no, nah, you pook it all the wee linty, but he's will no pook me. So wee Robin flew awa till he came to the Clucho Craig, and there he saw. Slee Todd Lowry sitting. And Slee Todd Lowry says, Where's two gone, wee Robin? And wee Robin says, I'm going awa to the king to sing him a sang this good yule morning. And Slee Todd Lowry says, Come here, wee Robin, and I'll let you see a bonny spot in the top of my tail. But wee Robin says, Na, na, Slee Todd Lowry, na, na. You worry the wee lammy, but he'll no worry me. So wee Robin flew awa till he came to a bonny burn side, and there he saw a wee callant sitting. And the wee callant says, Where's two gone, wee Robin? And wee Robin says, I'm going awa to the king to sing him a sang this good yule morning. And the wee callant says, Come here, wee Robin, 
and I'll give you a wheen grand mullins out of my pooch. But wee Robin says, Na, na, wee Callan, na, na, he spelled her at the gout spink, but he'll no spell her me. So wee Robin flew awa till he came to the king, and there he sat on a winnock soul and sang the king a bonny sang. And the king says to the queen, what will we gee to wee Robin for singing us this bonny sang? And the queen says to the king, I think we'll gee him the wee ran to be his wife. <laughs> so, so there you have, have the story of the, the Robin and the, and the wren. And uh, the thing about it is that uh, we think that was a story told by Robert Burns to his sister Isabella. There's no other exact version of that um, story apart from that one. There are lots of other versions of the marriage to the Robin and the Wren. So clearly it's a story that goes right the way back in, in history, even to the, the way in which the pronunciations of words um, are, are said, because in, in, uh, English, in the English language, especially in this country, um, in the 17th, 16th, 17th century, the sounds of certain vowels changed so uh, you often find you can date something from the way in which two words are supposed to rhyme together and they don't rhyme any longer. You can tell that that has to have been written at a time when, they, when those particular sounds did rhyme, because uh, otherwise it wouldn't make any sense. So that, that's, uh, that's uh, the story of the, of the Robin Redbreast and the Wren getting married. Uh, the idea is that, that then the Robin flies off again. Uh, I don't know whether he flies off with the Wren or not, and then goes back and sits on uh, uh, on a twig and and tweets away uh, as robins do now i really said about the idea of of it being very bad to kill a robin or wren as you probably know in the 19th century in this country uh, egg collecting a bird egg collecting was very popular um, and also that would be not just for collecting as in uh, having examples of of birds eggs but also sometimes to add to what you were going to eat for the week because uh, you know, poor people uh, had to live by whatever means they could and egg, uh, eggs, bird eggs were a good source of, of protein. So they would go and collect uh, bird eggs. Um, but if anybody was caught catching a robin or a wren egg, they would be surrounded by anybody else that was with them and they would be beaten up uh, basically. And this phrase would be said, Robin Tacker, Robin Tacker, sin, 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 or this other saying, hurt a Robin or a Ran, never prosper boy or man. So the whole idea was you didn't dare uh, take the eggs of a Robin or a Ran, except for the, the time at which they were to be replaced. So this last slide that I got, got up on the screen, which is the last bit of the, of the talk really, is about what I think is the great wheel of the year in terms of birds. And this is the, the year that I think the Celts would have observed. So as I think I said to you, the Celtic New Year was really around about the end of October and beginning of November. And that in the Celtic calendar is called Sahawain, uh, which is when the crow ushers in winter. Uh, so the crow is important at that time of year. And on the 1st of, Nove of November, uh, just as that turnover of, of, the, of that year happens, the swan becomes very important. So that's a black bird turning into a white bird, and that's the bringer of snow. Uh, on the 26th of December, Yule, which is the old word for Christmas time without, without uh, Christianity and being involved. So Yule was the word for, for the winter solstice. That was when the hunt the wren happens and still happens in some places. On the 1st of February, at the very beginning of the stories I was telling you about, all the birds come together and they have their birds assembly. And that's the festival of Imbolc, and that's to make decisions and also to choose their mate. And for those of you who give uh, uh, Valentine's cards on the 14th of February, that's the day that the birds chose their mate was the 14th of February. So in actual fact, in Valentine's Day has nothing to do with the Saint Valentine. It has to do with the old idea of birds finding their mate on the 14th of February. On the 21st, 22nd of March is Ostara, which is the spring equinox, and that's when the cuckoo becomes very important. And to this day, the cuckoo becomes king for a very little while, but because you probably know cuckoos are very badly behaved, they steal the, the nests of other birds, 
and they're not very nice birds, uh, they're tricksters. So in folklore, they're always considered to be a bit naughty. And uh, in Scotland, for example, on the 2nd of April, you've probably heard of April Fool's Day, which is the 1st of April. On the 2nd of April in Scotland, the day is called Gauk Day. And the idea is you stick um, labels on people's backs saying kick me or kiss me or, or you stick a tail on their, on their trousers and they don't know that's there. Uh, and that it's, it's a day for playing tricks on people is, the, is Gauk Day, the 2nd of, of April. Then you've got Eosta, and Eosta is one of the few festivals in the Celtic year, which is not a solar festival, it's a lunar festival. And it's worked out, as, and, and it's quite complicated, so I'll try and get this right. <coughs> Eosta or Easter is worked out uh, at the, by, in respect of the Sunday that follows the full moon after the spring equinox. So whenever uh, the spring equinox is, which is the 21st, 22nd of, of March, the next full moon after that will determine when Easter happens. So uh, that's the way it's still worked out in terms of the calendar we have today. And it's the only festival that we still have in our calendar that is a lunar festival. And the idea of that uh, because it's an unusual festival, it's a, it's a misbehaving festival. Remember what I said about the Celts really like this idea of things not being quite as they should be, not being quite as they seem. So on this particular day, it was believed that the hare could lay eggs. Uh, so, you, you know, the Easter eggs and things like that, they're not nothing to do with rolling away stones from tombs. They are to do with the fact that the hare could lay eggs and your Easter bunny has descended from being the Easter hare. Uh, it should actually be an Easter hare. It shouldn't be an Easter bunny at all. First of May, you've got Beltane, the lark, when, they, when the lark brings the fire to the earth. That's why it's a fire festival. Uh, 22nd, 24th of June is Letha, and that's when the hunt, the robin, would have occurred. Uh, the 1st of August, Lunasus or Lammas Day, is the raven. Uh, and to this day, one of the organizations I'm part of still holds certain meetings on Lammas Day. Uh, it's still recognized as being a day of importance. And the last day is the 21st of uh, September, Autumn Equinox, which is Goose Fairs. And to this day, you still get Goose Fairs being held in different parts of uh, the country. So that's that's the, the, the bird festival. And I just want to maybe stop there and uh, I'm trying to, can you stop the, the share there, um, Minji? Uh, yeah, I'll stop your sharing. That's superb. And uh, so if anybody's got any questions they want to ask me about uh, the, the stories I've told or anything else to do with it. <laughs> Harry, you've got a question? Okay. I have a, I have a comment. The, uh, the wren is the number one bird at building the speed by which he builds a nest. Oh. oh. And uh, I was in my carport once putting up uh, shelves on one side of the carport and it took me two days to put up the shelves and I also keep my motorcycle and my helmet in the carport and I, when I went to get my helmet the wren had ma already made a nest in my helmet <laughs> in, in two days <laughs> that's excellent uh, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah, so they are really, really skilled and, and really fast at building their nest. <laughs> okay. Fast cube builder. Um, I've got a question I can see here. Do people still hunt and kill wrens? Um, yes. Um, not very many now. Uh, and I think mostly it's ceremonial. So uh, in Ireland, you've still got the wren boys, the ran boys uh, who uh, go out. Um, on the 26th of December and uh, catch a wren. I don't think they kill it anymore. I think they catch it and then release it at the end of the day. But also um, I mentioned cuckoo fairs and goose fairs. Um, cuckoo fairs, it was traditional for a, an, an, old, an old woman to have a pouch or a, a purse in which she had a cuckoo. And at the start of the fair, she would release the cuckoo from the purse and the cuckoo would fly away. So these things still, still occur in some places. Mm. Gary, you have a question? Sorry? Gary has a question. Gary? OK, 
Okay. Is it unmuted? Yes. <clears throat> My question was, why does the wheel start in October? <clears throat> you had a all of the listing, and October was the start. Yeah, it's it's to do with uh, light and dark. Um, it was believed that the that <clears throat> certain times of the year, the veil between the supernatural and the real world, you know, the natural world and the supernatural, became very thin. <clears throat> And uh, it was believed that on the 31st of October over to about the 3rd or 4th of November was a time that the veil was very thin. So this was generally when the ceremony, when the, um, when the seasonal year was believed to, to turn over. Um, I can't tell you why that is the case, except that, you know, it, it like the 31st of October um, to the, the, the 4th of November is roughly halfway between the uh, equinox and the solstice uh, in, in, a, in a particular year. What I can tell you is that there were numerous types of new year. So that if you look at uh, Gawain and Green Knight, for example, it's very clear to tell that um, that particular story is being told at what was, what was considered much later on as being the proper new year. In other words, round about Yule turning over to uh, our, our first of, of January. But there was also a fiscal new year or a, or a financial new year, which started on the 31st of, of March, the 1st of, of April. And to some extent, that still exists in this country where a lot of uh, financial years finish on the 31st of, of March. I, I can't really explain why that is that there were uh, numerous kinds of new year, but the, the, there were. And it, it's a mistake to think that new year, um, as it now is, was the way it always was, because it certainly wasn't. I believe Albert also has a question in the chat box. Is there a link between Ren and George the Sixth? Uh, I, I I think I mean I, I think the Ren on the on the farthing is simply a throwback. It's simply um, a kind of cultural memory about how important the Ren was. The wren being often considered to be our smallest bird. It's not, as I said, the gold crest is our smallest bird, but it's often mistaken as being our smallest bird. And the farthing was our smallest coin at that time. So I think that's probably the link more than it is to do with George the the sixth as such. Um, um, Mark, I've got a question regarding your last slide, the wheel of the year. I noticed many of the words, they are not the English English I recognize. Which language is that? Um, well, quite a lot of them will, will have come from the Celtic times. So they, they might be, there might be an influence of uh, Norse in them. There might be an influence of old Breton, Bretonic um, uh, or Gallic um, or Gaelic. Um, all these languages would play into some of these, these words in, in different ways. Um, some of them may be old Anglo-Saxon as well. So it, because the, the Celtic, the, the area that the, the Celts came from or were part of, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's really Celtic, you, even using the word Celtic is, is complicated because uh, you can't say, well, the Celts were here and they weren't there because they were at times all over the place, right down to Turkey, if it comes to that. Turkey upwards uh, was at one time partly Celtic. So it's, it's kind of difficult, but the language, the languages are coming in all the time. And uh, yeah, there may be a Latin influence to some of the names as well. Most of them are probably pre-Latin uh, pre though. I have one more comment. Uh, first, I really, really enjoyed your presentation. And uh, 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 my uh, comment is when I was a young boy growing up in Northeast Mississippi, we had many, many birds and we could buy these uh, bird cards, but they didn't have their real name. They all, they had different names at that time. And oh. uh, some of those have carried over, but, but the two birds that did not have different names were the robin and the wren. Oh, during that <laughs> entire time, it, it was really, really interesting because and still in this country, most people call vultures buzzards. And, and I, I don't know why, I don't yeah. know why that is. And, uh, and like we, we had every different bird, but also another thing, almost all states in America 
have a have a state bird. For example, the state bird for Florida is the mockingbird. Oh, to yeah. kill mockingbird. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting that, isn't it? Because I, as I say, you know, Britain, most people, if you live in Britain, most people will assume it's the, the robin that's the uh, the na national bird and it's not. Um, but people, you know, I, I know quite a number of, of countries did decide and states did decide to choose a particular bird. In the little um, video that I played, there were a lot of words there used uh, that are old words for animals. So a Todd, for example, is a fox. Um, yeah, yeah. Todd right. Lowry. Right. Pussy Bodrin is a is a cat. Pussy Bodrin, uh -huh. and the, the uh, grey led um, gauk is the uh, is um, um, a hawk. A hawk. Mm -hmm. right. um, anybody has any other questions for this really interesting presentation about animals and the relationship to folklore? Uh, if not, maybe, Mark, we can talk about what's going to happen next week, because it will be very exciting, as usual. OK, yes. Uh, next week, um, the uh, as you know, I'm the president of the Robert Burns World Federation. And uh, our headquarters is in a little town called uh, Kilmarnock in, um, in, in Scotland. And it's not far from Ayr. But Kilmarnock is famous because when Robert Burns was seeking to get his poetry published, the first town that published his poetry was Kilmarnock. And they published his poetry on the 31st of July, 1786. So um, we're, we've decided to have a festival uh, running over the, um, the period from the 23rd of, of July to the 31st of July. And next Sunday, uh, Explore Culture is going to be uh, screened as part of the uh, festival, which is going to be called the Killy Burns Summer. So it's, it's going to be part of that. And uh, that particular afternoon, I'll be sitting in the headquarters building with some of my colleagues from the Burns world, and they'll be viewing in and uh, taking part in Explore Culture. Great. Um Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, we approached, Explore Culture approached Robert Burns World Federation in February. Since then, you not only have been attending a lot of the talks, but you've also contributed in so many things to the group. Um, thank you so much. So next week on Sunday, we will work out a collaboration mode for people in the group to have a little bit taste of the Kili Summer and the events organized by Robert Burns World Federation. Also uh, welcome if you are able to, I believe it's about 5 p.m. British summer time, 4 p.m. GMT. Uh, we will do uh, a little um, talk about Explore Culture, what we have been doing to the members of Robert Burns World Federation. So it's another interesting collaboration. Thank you very much, everybody. It's good to see you. Uh, have a good day. Have a good afternoon. Have a good evening. See you next week. Bye.